Hi everyone, my name is Jasser Shah and I'm a product manager on the web team at Twitter. And hey guys, my name is Charlie Kroom. I'm a web engineer on the web team at Twitter, uh, the team responsible for putting the, Twitter's, the new Twitter PWA into the Windows Store. So as we talk about this, I want to break it into a few pieces um, because the history of any PWA actually starts before it becomes a PWA. It starts with the structure of the team and some of the, the situations at Twitter that led us to a PWA. Then I'll talk about building the PWA for devices because we didn't just jump straight from a mobile app into the Windows Store. We started with bigger devices. Some of the things we learned and some of the things that might be next as well. All right, so this new app being a PWA, as I mentioned, its history starts long before we actually added it to the store. To start our journey, I want to give you a picture of the web team at Twitter, because I think it's important to understand the way we operate. You should know that we've never had an in-house Windows UWP team. So we are all web developers, all trained in JavaScript. Um, our previous app was actually done by a third party. So as we took this progressive approach, we followed in our development as well. So we progressively increased our goals uh, around that and the milestones. So back in the day, we were uh, two teams, actually. We had one for the mobile website, the old mobile website, and one for the desktop website. And we actually worked across several different types of code. To this day, some of our tests are still in Ruby, which was from about three iterations ago of the website. It's a fun little fact. And as we decided we wanted a new website, the mobile team started prototyping. So those 50% of our, our web engineers uh, spent some time figuring out what kinds of frameworks we wanted to use, and they stumbled upon React. And that's actually what our site has done in today. So as uh, the biggest change that they did was getting our development time faster. So previously, a change had to compile, then we'd refresh the page, and it took about a minute at times, because we compiled essentially all of Twitter. Uh, this new method actually allows us to see our changes reflected in under five seconds. This is a small note, but it has a huge impact when you think about the speed over time with which we can iterate. So after they were done uh, sort of playing around and making a prototype of that logged in experience, it was time to take it to the next level. So we wanted to make our team match the way we wanted our code to be. So if we're merging two code bases into one, it was necessary to merge our team into one team as well. You can't very well work in one code base if you have multiple teams. So we called this new team StarWeb. It's a play on asterisk web, get it? It's a little funny. It's OK. Um, and at this point, the framework that we had was actually pretty stable. The only big change we made was swapping out Flux, which was sort of popular back in the day, for Redux. Uh, so that was the, the major rewrite we did. And this is where we started to think of the app as a PWA, or a progressive web app. And though the definitions vary a little bit, this is essentially websites that are designed to get progressively better, that's the P in PWA, as more browser or operating system capabilities become available. So graceful degradation is sort of a popular term, or progressive enhancement. Those are sort of two sides of the same coin. So come April 17th, we had our first wide scale launch. This was kind of like the coming out parties for PWAs, and we finished with a lot of flag features such as data saver and push notifications. The new PWA that we launched was faster, lighter, and more engaging. It was faster because we want to make this client universally available to our users across a variety of network connections and speeds. It was lighter because the PWA was less than 600 KB to add to your home screen, which gives you that native app-like feeling without the weight of it. And it was a more engaging app because we added a feature called push notifications, which drew users back to the app and helped them stay informed with what matters. So as a PM of the client team at Twitter, our goal is to deliver a feature-rich, regularly updated experience. Um, with the expansion of the PWA to more platforms, I'd like to think about the impact that this has in two ways. First, there's the user point of view. So now we're delivering a more common interface to help Twitter feel familiar on any device. Um, a quick fun fact is that over 60% of our users on the PWA use more than one device, and that's where this familiarity across clients really be starts to become important. Um, then there's the developer point of view, where our developers now have fewer surfaces to update. So a, co a, co um, a strong core app means that you have less duplication of effort when it comes to building new features, and this allows our developers to focus on what really matters and what we're good at, such as performance. 
So an example of where regular updates is really impactful is when we're launching new features. We recently launched a feature called Bookmarks, and it actually came to the PWA first. Um, one of the reasons it actually came to the PWA first is because it was quicker to build and also easier to release and quicker to release from an engineering perspective. Um, so with the development of features like this that are coming to the PWA, now that Windows has the PWA, your win our Windows users also have access to these features, and we can keep this cycle going on. And this ensures that no client is ever left behind when we're building new features. So with the successful launch of our first PWA under our belts, we wanted to continue pro to progressively expand the site. And so our new target became making this single website, a single code base that serves not only our mobile users that we started with, but our desktop users as well, and really users on any web interface. That could be dozens of platforms across hundreds of different devices and configurations. So that takes us up to today. And uh, integrating with a platform-specific store such as Microsoft is actually a huge boon. When you think about one of the major drawbacks of PWAs is that it doesn't have a distribution mechanism. There's no way for users to necessarily discover it in the same way. Uh, and so it would be limited if it were just constrained to a website. People have been trained on their mobile devices to essentially go to the store and look for an app. And if they don't see Twitter there, they might not use it. Uh, so websites often get left behind. Adding it to the store brings a lot of value to users from a discovery perspective. And so I'm sure everyone here has heard of a PWA, and you guys are somewhat familiar with it at this point in the conference, but we live in a tech bubble. We're developers and people in the community. The users don't care that it's a PWA as much. They care about having a quality experience. And oftentimes, the best way for us to deliver that to them is by doing this PWA, by taking advantage of what we're good at. So this is a picture I took of some of you guys. As I mentioned, uh, PWA and web wrapper, there's this sort of bias that it can't be good. And I shared that, too. I started back in the day, and I could tell my Bank of America app was just a website. Um, our goal is that through talking through some of the decisions we made, by the end of the talk, we can switch you over to looking like this. And before I go too far into the process we used, I want to make sure you know that I'm not saying PWAs are the be-all, end-all. There is definitely still many places in the ecosystem where native is the right choice. What I'm encouraging you to do is look at your particular company, your goal, whatever it is, and consider PWA as a tool in that toolbox. So many things that are games or uh, do really low-level integrations or work heavily with media might be a better choice as native. But when we looked at our options and our resources for Twitter, it was clear that a PWA was going to give both us and our users the best experience. OK, let's do this. How did we take a small mobile-only experiment and get it ready for something like a Windows desktop? So we didn't just take our mobile website and launch it in the Microsoft Store. First, we analyzed the feature gap. We started by looking at our Windows users and found that over 70% of them were desktop um, users. So then we started to describe things that a desktop or a mobile user might care about. A mobile user cares about their app being lightweight, performant, and fast, whereas a desktop user cares about it being immersive, complementary, and convenient. Here's where you see, start to see a fundamental conflict. Um, complementary to us meant adding more related modules to create a never-ending browsing experience, which means more code. But how do we keep the app lightweight at the same time all in one code base? This, is, this conflict starts to hint at why progressiveness in web apps is so important, and then that we need to get the right experience to the right users all from a single code base. So while doing that, we realized that it's not enough to take a web experience and just throw it in a wrapper. A quality PWA requires that your site is built with a variety of experiences and use cases in mind. The entire team must understand the goal, and the site must have progressiveness built into its DNA. So this is sort of a cool concept. And it started to really hit home for me one day when I was talking with Nicholas Gallagher, who's one of our former engineers and works on React Native Web right now. And we were talking about parameters. So parameters are something we think of a function or a method as taking. They sort of change the way it works. But you can extend this to think about your app or your website as having parameters as well. And what this means is uh, you can customize the functionality based on these inputs. So as an example, uh, a user's data situation might be a parameter to your app. Here uh, in Twitter, it's a parameter we explicitly allow them to change from the drop-down menu, but we could also queue it off network conditions using the network API, or we could queue it off country or other signals that we might have about their network. Uh, 
And what I want to emphasize here is that as this parameter changes, it affects everything throughout our app. We start using uh, uh, very lightweight images to reduce the amount of data up to 90 or even 95%. That can save users literal money in a lot of countries where they pay per megabyte. The other thing we do is in the background, background we reduce some of the polling and we reduce the number of network connections to try and keep it a little bit faster. So I view Data Saver as a key feature of something I'd call a big P PWA, a site that has progressiveness built into its DNA, as Jessar mentioned. Big P PWAs are things that take these parameters and use them to react in tangible ways that shape the core user experience. So how did we do this at Twitter? As we scaled our app from mobile to desktop, one of the parameters is obviously screen size. Another is modality that we dealt with, whether the user is on a touch or a pointer device, because that can change the way our site works. So one example, here's the sidebar layout, one of the first things we introduced. So uh, in the talks yesterday you might have seen, we mentioned what's the core experience of this page. It's looking at the user and their profile. On mobile, we do that. On desktop, we have more space to work with, so we can show you that complementary and engaging experience. We can show you some of their media. We can show you similar users. And we're looking to do more here in the future. Another really cool thing that was pretty recent, actually, is a master detail layout. This goes one step further and actually shows two routes, two screens, side by side at the same time. So clearly on mobile, you have the conversation itself. But on desktop, we can show the inbox route as well. This allows you to switch very easily between things that would take longer in a mobile layout. Uh, and it's not just the layouts that are affected as well. So here, if you click on uh, a photo from the FAA, you can see this media gallery. And one thing you'll notice is that on desktop, we have a modal experience. That's much more the uh, platform expectation when you're on a desktop. People expect a modal for these lightweight interactions. On mobile, it's a full screen gallery. And we do one more thing as well. If you support touch, we won't show this arrow, which is to say, if you're on a mouse, we show this arrow to help guide you in how you might change photos. There's multiple photos in this gallery. On mobile, where users are familiar with the touch patterns, you can just swipe, so we don't need to show that. Another interesting thing we do is, again, for touch targets, they need to be larger. They need to have space to differentiate themselves from things around, so you don't fat finger something. So here on mobile or touch devices, we show a, a modal sheet which is more traditional. And on desktop, we change this to a drop-down that'll occur where the click happened. This gives you a little bit more lighter weight experience and contextual clicks. And as Jessar was talking about, it's important to have the DNA of your site include progressiveness, to make sure that there's a right way of doing things. So to change something from a, a route, a standard page, to a modal, this is actually what we did for the media detail screen or our image gallery. All we do is we change it from a route to a modal route using this one component that we use. So Malti, uh, Malta actually had a good talk from Google. He was at JSConf earlier this year. And he mentioned large JavaScript code bases. And if you're making a PWA that's going to serve mobile and desktop and do everything you expect from Twitter, it's going to get huge. And what he mentioned specifically is the idea of taking the human component, the human uh, pretension for error out of the equation by setting up systems that people can't help but use correctly. So that same concept is paramount to creating a big P PWA. And it's what I mean it's when I say it has to be part of the code's DNA. So when someone goes next time to switch one of our pages into a modal, it's going to be so easy, and there's only one way to do it, that they can't help but pr create a great progressive experience by default. So after adding those features, we were pretty confident we had a solid widescreen experience, a good starting point to work with bigger screens and mice. And now I want to talk specifically about how we brought, Windows, uh, brought the app to Windows 10 and the Microsoft Store. So uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but to bootstrap everything, we used pwabuilder.com, downloaded the build it gives you, and it's actually, at that point, basically ready to upload. We swapped out a few logos for some branding things, and we changed uh, some of the version info. The other thing that's important is not popular at Microsoft conferences, but we all use Macs at Twitter. And so I needed to find a way to iterate very quickly to make sure that I didn't get bogged down trying to test all these things. Uh, so I ended up using VirtualBox and one of the Microsoft provided VMs uh, for that as well. You can talk more about that if you want later. But before we launched this, we wanted to get it to insiders to collect feedback. We didn't really have a clear sense of what our Windows user base wanted and hoped this would help us build a better product suited for their needs. So the insider program allowed us to get feedback from users in different countries and languages, which was 
really great because it allowed us to address a more diverse set of feedback that we would have missed otherwise. One of the issues that we discovered was that we were showing the EU cookie notice at every session. And given that our development team is rarely in the EU, the beta program was a huge help in finding this and also helping us address it. Um, we also got a ton of feedback from Twitter, um, which allowed us to have a conversation with our users. For instance, um, when you're a mobile user, you rarely paste images into the composer. But as a desktop user, that's a pattern that's very common. So some, this is some of the feedback that we got from Twitter. And it really helped us iterate and shape our roadmap for Windows. So as we gathered this feedback, we wanted to make further strides towards being this big P PWA. Um, we already had a great widescreen experience, but we wanted to integrate more deeply with the operating system and take advantage of some of the APIs that that allowed to make the app more retentive and to provide better value to users when they have it available. So on the previous screen, uh, you saw here, uh, this was something I played with on the way up. It's playing with timeline integrations and how that might work. Maybe you view a live event and you have to go away from your computer. When you come back, we can put an entry into your timeline and say, hey, if you want to go catch up on what you missed, here's a way to do it. The other things you'll see in the app today are secondary tiles. So you can pin users uh, to actually get deeper into the app and just launch directly on their page. If you have something in mind you want to do, look at your notifications, compose a new tweet, you can use jump links to do that as well. Share integration doesn't come for free quite yet. So we actually integrated both share from Twitter and share to Twitter. Uh, and the one thing I want to talk about is share integration. So yesterday, I talked about how you would share from Twitter to another app. But now I want to cover how you would share to Twitter from an app. So say you're in your mail or a website, and you see something you want to share. So the first thing you're going to do is add uh, this code to your app manifest. It's basically telling Windows what files can be shared to your app or what types of files. It's not too much of a change, pretty straightforward. All right. The next thing I want to do, and this has a little bit to do with share, but more to do with saving you a ton of headache. I searched for days to find this one line of code. I went on a spirit quest and pulled it out from uh, a kind recommendation from someone at Microsoft. It is really hard to find. So put this in your app. It will prevent your app or your PWA from reloading before an activation happens. So that means the user won't see your app flicker and refresh when they're handling an event. And the next thing you're going to do is uh, you want to actually handle that activate event. Activates are things from just opening the app to clicking one of those secondary tiles to a jump link to the share integration. And so when we handle that activation event, we're going to do four things. We're going to make sure it's a share event and deal with that specifically. We're going to gather all the data that's contained on that share event. We're going to do whatever you want to do in your apps. For us, that's compose a tweet. And we're going to call back to the window and say we're done. So remember, we're opening our share on top of another app. And you can't use that app until we close our share interface. So you want to clean up after yourself. All right, handling the activate event is as easy as you would think. Check the kind. If it's a share target, it's a share event. It's pretty great. This is where it gets a little, a little more interesting. So every event, every share event, has a title and a description. In my travels, I found the description to be not super useful. Um, but we include it anyways, because we're going to allow the user to edit the tweet so they can decide whether it's useful to them or not. Uh, you might find varying apps use the description well or not. Uh, and here, I've sort of reduced this example to only handling text. So we'll check and see if our share event contains text. If it does, we'll put it in the tweet. Otherwise, we won't, and we'll move on. In the future, you can scale up to supporting URLs and images. It gets a little more complicated as you mix them, but this is the basic approach. So from there, we take all that data we collected, and using React Router, we send it over to the composer. And then we set a callback, too, so that when the composer is done, it'll close the share target, and we're all set. Um, I know that's a lot to take in. There's some pretty solid examples like this on the developer forums and some of the new PWA docs that launched. So check those out. There's good ways to help you use some of these very common APIs. And like I said, you don't have to think of this as the be-all, end-all. You can start with just supporting text in your app and expand to support images and files that are a little bit harder. Progressiveness extends to native APIs as well. So it's OK to start small and grow over time. So thinking ahead, um, the Twitter app already has a few OS integrations, but there's a huge variety of APIs provided by Microsoft. It's actually a little overwhelming. Um, there's, there's like lots of crazy ways that you can leverage them to enhance your app. For instance, you could use their image recognition API to read un uncaptioned images, and we could use proximity detection to find local hashtags. 
Or if you were at the keynote, they use the IoT clicker to tweet. So that's another integration you could do. Um, of course, did this, this entire process did not come without challenges. We did run into a few issues along the way. From a product development perspective, we had to prioritize and make trade-offs on the features that we were going to deliver. So we had to give some features up in the short term, such as night mode, which is coming soon, um, but in order to build a consistent experience in the long term. On the flip side, though, there were features like data saver, bookmarks, and live engagement that came to PWA first. And as Windows users, you will be able to use them first as well. And on the technical side, there's a few things that are interesting. Some people pointed out there's no good way of finding out when we update things. Because you're making all the changes on the web side of your code, and we release every day, people aren't going to find updates in the release notes in the Microsoft Store. So we're still figuring out how we might convey that in the future. Um, one of the things that's difficult right now, but I think is coming later on, uh, is updating live tiles and service workers. So the intuitive way to do it would be to, to handle a push in your service worker, perhaps. And uh, the issue with that is you actually can't interact with the Microsoft APIs in the service worker right now, I think, um, but perhaps soon. And coordinated code launches can be difficult as well. So keep in mind, sometimes you have to make changes in both your Microsoft code that goes into the store and on your website. So one of the easy things to do is just to feature gate to make sure that once your code goes into the Microsoft Store, then you can turn it on on the website. And that takes some of the, the work out of it. All right, so at the end of the day, PWAs are an incredibly valuable tool in your toolbox. So make sure that it's the right thing you want to do. Make sure you should be using a PWA first. And once you do that, think about the different parameters. Think of how you might change your app to adapt to user or device constraints or things that are available uniquely on those devices. And finally, use those to give the best experience possible to each user. It's OK to have push on devices that support it and not on uh, older devices as well. So this, of course, wouldn't be possible without the entire web team at Twitter who have worked on all the great features you guys use. We use it every day, just like you do. And trust me, we're just as excited for night mode and all the features that people have been suggesting. So huge thanks to everyone there for their tireless work to help make this the best PWA in the world. And if you're interested, we actually are going to be hiring shortly. So if you have any interest uh, in coming to work on this and make it better on all platforms, let me know. And we're happy to chat more about PWAs, Twitter in general. We're out of time here, but we'll be over in the web area uh, by the PWA booth if you guys have any questions. So thanks, for much for, thanks so much for having us, and have a great rest of your build.